Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Mondays with Monday. That's me, Jim Mundy, the historian for the Union League Legacy Foundation. Our last episode in April was a celebration of the 200th birthday of Ulysses S. Grant. Pretty neat. I thought it was, I was a great episode myself. But in that episode, we were introduced to a League member named John Russell Young. And I like John Russell Young a lot, and I hadn't really uh, done anything or thought anything about him until that episode. And then I realized I really like Russell Young. He was quite a character, um, Union League member who had become a newspaper journalist, managing editor, author, a, a diplomat, an ambassador, and eventually librarian of Congress. And then there's the fact that his portrait in the league is one of my favorite ones in the collection. I did an episode about that earlier. So I thought, let's, leave, let's dig a little deeper into John Russell Young and see what he looks like. I think he's really a neat guy. So, so here we go. Um, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to start with, here we go. So we're gonna do the slideshow and from the beginning and it worked, voila. How do you like that? Okay, given what a, a fascinating life he had and what a varied life he had, I thought we'd call this a man for all seasons because I think he certainly was. So let's get started. All right, so this is John Russell Young. As you can see, he was born in 1840. Actually, he was born in County Tyrone in Ireland. Uh, back then, it was part of the Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. Today, it would be part of Northern Ireland. So it's in the northeast corner of the island itself. His father was a weaver, but like many Irish weavers in the mid 19th century, he emigrated to the United States and specifically to Philadelphia, because Philadelphia was the center of the textile industry in the United States. And so the Youngs arrived in 1841. And there would eventually be four young children, two boys and two girls. Uh, his father found work, and they were moving along quite successfully, as a lot of the immigrant families were in that time. But then in 1851, uh, John Russell Young's mother died, and apparently he was very attached to her, and she was his, I think, his, his heart and soul in many ways. And at that point, the family was dispersed because the father was no longer capable of taking care of four children by himself. And so John Russell Young was sent to an uncle in New Orleans for four years, and he would return to Philadelphia in 1855. And at that point, he found work for with another uncle who owned his own print shop. And the next year, he goes by, and in 1856, John Russell Young realizes that, you know, he, maybe he likes the printing business, or at least the newspaper business. And so he writes a letter uh, rather boldly for a 16-year-old boy to the owner and editor of the New York Tribune, Horace Greeley, of all people. And Greeley regretfully did not reply in a very kind, polite, or encouraging fashion. He was actually pretty mean-spirited in his reply. But it didn't put John Russell Young off his trail, so to speak, because ironically, in 10 years, John Russell Young would become the editor of the New York Tribune, Horace Greeley's own newspaper. So, so obviously, there was a lot of, John Russell Young was made up of a lot of stern stuff. So the next year in 1857, he gets a job working as a copy boy for a Philadelphia newspaper called the Philadelphia Press that was owned by a character. That's all I can think to call him right now. Quite a character. His name was, um, this guy here, was uh, John Wien Forney. Now, Forney was from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He owned a few newspapers in Lancaster and Philadelphia and eventually in Washington, D.C. He was also a Democrat and uh, politically active and, and a personal friend of James Buchanan, whom Forney would help get elected to the presidency in 1856. But Forney wasn't rewarded his due spoils as he considered them. And so he would eventually break with Buchanan and become a Republican and support Abraham Lincoln's election in 1860. But in the meantime, Forney's making political connections because between 1851 and 1857, he was the clerk in the House of Representatives and after Lincoln's election between 1861 and 1868, he would become the secretary of the United States Senate. So, so Forney is in an incredibly interesting position, both from his politics and his position in Washington, but also from his being a newspaper owner and editor. And he would become John Russell Young's mentor in many, many ways, politically, I think socially, spiritually perhaps in some ways. Um, and he would imbue in young John Russell Young, this spirit of abolitionism, of union, of patriotism, 
and that would carry Russell Young through the end of his life. So how did that all work out? Let's find out. So the Civil War begins um, on April the 9th, I'm, I'm sorry, April the 12th of 1861. And Forney, at, um, at this point, John Russell Young, working for Forney in his newspaper, is going to become one of the very first battlefield reporters in the Civil War, and apparently a very good one at that. So John Russell Young was actually at the first battle of the Civil War, the first battle of uh, Manassas, or um, as, as, as it was known. And his reporting apparently was just stellar. And the battle itself was fascinating because it was a battle that wasn't expected, to, wasn't in the traditional sense of battles. That is, people rode out from Washington, D.C. in their carriages and their horses and their picnic baskets expecting to see this kind of show, but it was a real battle. And the first Battle of Bull Run, as it was also known, uh, was not the expected Union victory, but a Confederate victory. And it was clear the war was going to drag on and on and on and on. But nonetheless, John Russell Young establishes himself as one of the first and most competent battlefield reporters in American journalistic history, if you will. All right. So in 1862, the war was still on. Philadelphia is a divided city, as we've heard in some previous episodes. And in the fall of 1862, a group of men decide to create a patriotic social society. And they met on November the 15th, and they called themselves uh, the Union Club of Philadelphia. And John Russell Young was at that meeting. And so he's at the very ground level, at the ground floor of what would become known as the Union League of Philadelphia on December 27th of 1862, when it was officially organized. And so Russell Young now is the youngest member of the Union League. It's, he joined officially on January the 16th of 1863. He's 23 years old. And he's joined this group of just esteemed citizens, uh, politicians, industrialists, bankers, lawyers, doctors, you name it. Pretty heady stuff for 23 year old. So, but nonetheless, he was there on the ground floor and, and all the better for him. So, and he's so, out Forney, because he's busy being uh, the Secretary of the US Senate, is leaving all of the management of, the, of his newspapers to John Russell Young, who is obviously going to Washington, D.C. to consult with Forney. And while in Washington, he meets young Rose Fitzpatrick, whom he marries in 1864. And eventually they would have three children, none of whom regretfully would live to adulthood. And that was a great sorrow to John Russell Young himself and caused him some levels of melancholy, as he used to call it, in the 19th century. And uh, Rose would be the dutiful wife. She would uh, follow Forney and his travels between Washington and Philadelphia and his others' travels until in 1881, she would die from many, many different illnesses. And that was that. And uh, Russell Young would go on to marry two more times. We'll get that later on in the narrative. So that was that. So now it's 1865, John Russell Young, and there are no photographs of him as a young man, regretfully, but here we have this, this drawing of him that appeared in a newspaper of all things. In 1865, he would move to New York, he would break with Forney, not unusual. Forney was quite um, a volatile personality, if that makes sense. So John Russell Young moves to New York, where he gets a job working for Horace Greeley and becomes the managing editor of the New York Tribune. And again, pretty heady stuff for a kid. At this point, he was only 25 years old. So, so at this point, his newspaper career is established, and it will, and he will continue to be a newspaper reporter, a journalist, practically until the day he dies in 1899. So, that's so that's what that's John W. Forney, and he, in the as he looked in his um, 20s and in, in his 30s, uh, he would continue to write for Greeley uh, and manage Greeley's empire, which was pretty interesting because Greeley was quite a character in his own right, much like Forney was in his. But eventually things would, you know, change personalities and things like that. And so in 1869, John Russell Young resigns from the New York Herald. And uh, at this point uh, was doing some work for the US government. Uh, you know, after all, he had connections in Washington through Forney earlier. And so he was getting, he was doing work for the State Department and the Treasury Department. And we eventually get to know the Secretary of State, Hamilton Fish, and would do some, some work for him specifically in Europe. So, so now Forney, uh, or rather, forgive me, John Russell Young is kind of transitioning into a new occupation in some ways, if you will. So 
1872, uh, he joins the staff of one of Greeley's competitors in New York, the New York Herald, which would eventually become known as the paper of James Bennett Gordon. So uh, back to being a journalist again. All right. And again, he is a he's actually assigned to Europe, London specifically, he would travel all through the European capitals, but he becomes the Herald's chief European correspondent. So now he's getting connected to all of these people, personalities, places and events that are going on in Europe in the 1870s. In the meantime, back in America, Ulysses S. Grant is the president. Right? And of course, Grant knew of Young through his Civil War reporting and things like that. So uh, Grant would leave, would leave office in early 1877. He ends up in London where Young is still there working for the Herald. And John Russell Young holds a dinner in Grant's honor, a press dinner. And a few months after that, Grant and his wife, Julia Dent Grant, are going to go on a two and a half year tour around the world to circumnavigate the globe. And maybe not surprisingly, U.S. Grant asks John Russell Young to accompany them on the entire trip. And that's what he does. This is the SS Indiana leaving Philadelphia on uh, May the 17th of 1877. And it would be two and a half years before the Grants and John Russell Young make it back to Philadelphia, or make it back to Philadelphia, quite literally. And that's where they end up in 1879. So, and in the meantime, though, uh, John Russell Young is sending newspaper articles back to New York to be published in the New York Herald. And these articles will eventually be collected into a book called Around the World with General Grant. But, but while he was in Europe, actually take that back. Obviously, this is not Europe. This is China because in, the very, in 1879, at the back end of the trip, the Grants and Young were in Asia, China, Japan, Korea. And this is a, a really fascinating period of time for Asian history. And so Grant, acting as a pseudo diplomat for the American government, meets the gentleman on the right, Li Hong Chang, who was at that point General Chung and one of the political and military leaders in China as it was re, uh, uh, kind of really kind of opening up to the West, if that makes any sense. So Ford, he got to meet Li Hong Chung. And that would lead to an interesting occurrence at the lake in 1896. And we'll get to that one later as well. So here's the book that John Russell Young published in 1879, uh, basically a compilation of his articles from his trip around the world with General Grant. So that's 1879, right? Okay. And this is what Young was looking like as he aged through the, eight, to the late 19th century. Um, really very distinguished man, but love that mustache. You gotta get, you really have to like that mustache. I think so. All right. Now it's 1881. Young is still a correspondent, uh, but looking for something else to do. And U.S. Grant, very highly of, of Young. And so he suggested to U.S. President James Garfield that Young be made ambassador to China. Now, Garfield apparently had his own thoughts and didn't take Grant's advice at that point in time. But uh, when Chester Arthur became president on Garfield's death from assassination, and, and Garfield, I'm sorry, Chester is in office now in 1882, Grant tries again. And this time, Chester Arthur listens. And so he nominates and Young is appointed as ambassador to China. And again, now here's a he's 42 years old at this point in time in his life. He's been he's he's been a newspaper, he's been a copy boy, a reporter, a managing editor, uh, and now he's an you know an author and he's traveled the world, he's seen all of Western Europe, and now he's an ambassador to China. I mean, what better stuff could happen to John Russell Young? Well, it could be quite a few things. So he would be ambassador until 1884 when there was no uh, when the presidential election changed parties from Republican to Democrat because Young was a diehard Republican. And he offered his resignation to the incoming president, Grover Cleveland, which was accepted because after all, he wanted Cle uh, Cleveland to, to appoint his own uh, ambassadors, if you will. So that was in 1884. But while um, all this was going on, Young, who, who was in London at one point in time, uh, met a young lady named Julia Coleman. And 
he would eventually marry her, actually in 1884, and they would move back to the United States, where actually, no, they wouldn't actually, she would go to China with Young, but the weather wasn't good for her, she was in poor health, and the doctors recommended she go to Western Europe to recover, specifically Paris. Now, in the meantime, she was pregnant uh, with Young's fourth child, her first, and she would give birth in Paris, in 1891, but she would die shortly, uh, I'm sorry, in um, 1884, and she would, well, she would die shortly after, married for two years, regretfully. Young just wasn't having much luck that way. So, but as it is, uh, he is now a widower again. So it's a, so at that point, uh, he's a reporter for the Herald. Uh, he comes back to, he, he moves around actually, uh, he's, he's back in Western Europe, he's in Philadelphia, and at this point, uh, he will come back to Philadelphia almost permanently because in 1890, he will resign his position with the New York Herald, and he will come back to Philadelphia, and after all, that was the city he considered his home. And he was getting involved in Republican politics in the city because Philadelphia was the major Republican city in the country, and that led him back to the Union League of Philadelphia, where he was still a member. He'd been a member all these years. And not ha for not having been an active member of the Union League and never having been on the board of directors, at the annual meeting on December the 12th of 1892, John Russell Young was elected as the 11th president of the Union League of Philadelphia. But at that meeting, uh, something very interesting happened because in that fall, in November, there had been another American presidential election and Grover Cleveland, who had left office after four years, been succeeded by Benjamin Harrison, now defeated Benjamin Harrison and is back in office again. And in that election, a number of league members showed their support for Cleveland and the Democratic Party. Uh, there were, you know, Cleveland had some policies, special monetary policies that were very amenable to some Republicans, but it caused a rift inside the league house in terms of its politics and the old guard Republicans led by General Lewis Wagner, if you will, um, created a suggested at that annual meeting that the words Republican Club be inserted into the Union League's bylaws. Regretfully, they could not vote that night on that motion. It was postponed until the next annual meeting in December of 1893, where presiding at his first annual meeting as president, General Wagner once again suggested that the Union League insert the words Republican Club in the League's bylaws. Um, it was not, it was probably one of the most contentious annual meetings in Union League history because everybody was convinced that was the right thing to do. And some of the members, mostly lawyers, didn't even think that it would up, uphold a challenge on the constitutional level as well. And the result was that after the vote was taken that night, the League members themselves declined the motion. They voted against it. It didn't get the two thirds vote that it needed. But nonetheless, they did pass a resolution stating that the Union League was a distinctly Republican institution and organization. And from that point on, it became a requirement for membership that candidates for membership vote Republican in American presidential elections. So that is one interesting legacy of John Russell Young's presidency of the Union League in 1893 and 1894. But other things were about to happen in his life, no doubt. As you can see, it was a, a very fascinating life. Nothing dull about it. And this is Young's official portrait done by Robert Bono. And it hangs in the founder's room on the first floor of the League House. And it is one of my all time favorite portraits to me. I just, it, it, it just speaks to the character of the man after all those years. It's just, I just love it. So that is that. So it's 1893, Young retires from the League, so to speak. And he's not doing much else. But then in 1896, Li Hong Chang comes back into the picture. Right at this point, he's the viceroy of China. He had been in Russia for the coronation of Alexander II, and on his way back to China, he stops in the United States, where he meets John Russell Young in New York. And John Russell Young invites him to come to Philadelphia and to come to the League. And Li Hong Chang accepts. And there was a there was a as you can see it was a luncheon held at the Union League on September the third of eighteen ninety six. And I'll let you read the menu. But Li Hong Chung, who at this point is just fast friends with with John Russell Young, actually gives Young the courtesy of visiting Young at his house in Philadelphia. Something I don't think you'll see very many viceroys of any country do that. 
for a private citizen like John Russell Young, but he did. So, so it's 1896. In the meantime, John Russell Young is still writing periodic articles for the, for the New York Herald, James Gordon Bennett. But that's not going to last for long. All right. All right. Um, William McKinley is elected president in 1898. The Librarian of Congress, A.R. Spofford, uh, had been there for close to 30 years, and the library was not in good condition. It was still in physically in the Capitol building itself, and uh, Spofford had and got approval from Congress to build a new, the first actually independent Library of Congress building. That's what you see here in this photograph. And so this, and but but Spofford was pretty much at the end of his life expectancy as a librarian of Congress. He had, you know, not everybody thought he was the right choice. And as you can imagine, um, many of Young's Republican friends were suggesting actually that, that McKinley suggest him for another ambassadorial position, specifically China, although he would have preferred Spain of all places, believe it or not. But there, I, it's not clear whether they didn't have attraction for it, what was going on there, but um, Somebody suggested then that Young be nominated for Librarian of Congress. And after all, he, he was already an author. Uh, by this time, he'd written another book on a memorial history of Philadelphia. Uh, he was a journalist. Uh, he knew he was a man of culture, of reading. And literally, on the day that he was nominated for Librarian of Congress in the US Senate, he was, nom he was accepted at the same time, the first and only time that had ever really happened at that point in time. So he's the first Librarian of Congress actually appointed by Congress in that respect. Now, many people thought he was just a, being a political appointee would be a, a, a political hack in the office itself. But John Russell Young really just rolled up his sleeves and did the best he could to create a whole new environment and culture for the Library of Congress. He thought it should be a true research library, not just a collection of books. And keep in mind that Thomas Jefferson's library is still making up the core of the Library of Congress at this point in time, all right, within the collection itself. And John Russell Young, you know, he, he tried, you know, he, he went about creating or I guess eliminating the old bureaucracy and trying to invigorate the Library of Congress by bringing in professional librarians, uh, very competent librarians. He also helped integrate the staff of the Library of Congress. Uh, by the time uh, he left, well, he didn't leave the office, he would actually die in office just 18 months later. But by the time he died, 25% of the, of the workforce Library of Congress would be women, 10% would be African Americans. Uh, so he, he did his best uh, to really uh, take this institution and turn it around 180 degrees and would, would eventually become one of the great collecting libraries in the world. Um, but in the meantime, John Russell Young was having some health problems. He'd always, you know, he's always had neuralgia, rheumatism, uh, migraine headaches and things like that. And he was beginning to suffer from falling a lot. And at this point, uh, he had already married his third wife, May Davids. Uh, he met her in London. And they were living in Washington, D.C. And they had a son already named Gordon Russell Young, who would eventually become an, an engin a municipal engineer in Washington, D.C. But so uh, it's Christmas Eve. Uh, and John Russell Young was at home and he fell going up the steps into this front house and fell flat on his face. And that seemed to be the beginning of the end because he recovered from that and he was, the next week was walking up the front steps, the marble steps to the Library of Congress when he fell again. And from that fall, he never really recovered. And he would die literally three weeks later on January the 17th, 1899. And he was the shortest tenured librarian of Congress, and this is what he looked like as Librarian of Congress. You can just, but just you can see the penetrating look in his face and the eyes and everything else. I mean, I just what a character. So, so he died in Washington D.C., and that is where his funeral was held. On this, by the way, is the the great the entrance hall to the Library of Congress. And if you look, you can see uh, on the ground floor there are these two plain panels of marble uh, on the interior of the hallway itself. And on those panels are the names of the Librarian of Congress. And there is John Russell Young. And there, I can guarantee you, there's no other club in the country that had a member, let alone a president, who was also a Librarian of Congress. And I think that's kind of cool. So, 
So this is St. John's, St. John's Church, Lafayette Square in Washington, D.C. It's still there to this day. The funeral was held there. Um, the entire Chinese delegation in Washington, D.C. attended the funeral in respect and honor. A rare honor because that just doesn't happen in the world of diplomacy and politics. A trainload of Union League members uh, arrived in Washington, D.C. for the funeral. And with them, they had John Russell Young's portrait which was placed on an easel inside the church for the funeral service itself. Pretty neat stuff like that. And after the funeral, John Russell Young's body was brought back to Philadelphia on a train. And he was buried in Mount Moriah Cemetery in Southwest Philadelphia. And Mount Moriah has had a tough time, but it's getting a whole lot better too, and incredible efforts from some volunteers. And we now know where this, where his tombstone is and you can actually see it coming through some of the weeds and stuff like that. And so that is where he rests to this day in Southwest Philadelphia. So I hope you've enjoyed that story. To me, I, it's just, I, you know, what makes the league so fascinating is just its members and who they were, what they did and how they contributed to so much of the world history that we know it. And so, you know, um, I hope you enjoyed it. That's all I can say. So uh, needless to say, we'll find more members like that as well. So, so on that note, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I hope you tune in the next time for another episode of Mondays with Monday. So thank you. Stay well and take care. Goodbye.